All right. Merry Christmas, everybody. Welcome to the Bill Sang Podcast. My name is Bill Sang. I'd like to welcome you to a special Christmas edition of this show. And I'd like to welcome you to the show tonight. And uh, tonight, obviously, we're going to be talking about Christmas. And one of the things I want to point out real fast, I've heard throughout the years, um, even in school, I've heard sort of the argument made that this time of the year is a Actually, I've heard that summer is a particularly sad time of the year, but I've also heard that Christmas is a particularly sad time of the year. This is oftentimes around the time of year when people have memories with loved ones that they no longer have. And some people have made the case that we should not be so happy as a result of that. And I'd like to push against that. I think that we need to embrace those memories. I think that we need to embrace the season. And I think that we need to make it just merry, make it happy, make it something that fills other people for full of joy as a result um, of the joy that we are experiencing ourselves, that we are able to uplift people, cheer people up, and just make it a great time of the year. As the song says, it's the most wonderful time of the year. I would say that's disputable due to the weather, but as far as the festivities, as far as the sort of festivals that do go on, I would say that this, in many respects, is the most wonderful time of the year. It's a time to be happy. It's a f- time to be able to enjoy family. It's a time to be able to enjoy friends. It's a time to be generous. And it's all because of this wonderful holiday that we call Christmas. We're going to talk about that a little bit here in a moment. But I do want to make you aware of something that I am doing right now. It is called the World of Worldview series. And I am going through different popular topics of our day. And I am unwrapping those. I am bringing them to light and talking about what the Bible has to say about these different topics. And so far I've done aliens and I have done dinosaurs. I'm planning on my next one to be on evolution, so stand by for that. Um, but again, that is not the topic for tonight. The topic for tonight is indeed Christmas. And you, many of you have heard that Christmas is a pagan holiday. My goodness, this argument drives me out of my mind. Now you can make the argument that maybe some of the traditions of Christmas are derived from pagan traditions, but I don't like the argument that Christmas has pagan origins. Christmas in no way has pagan origins as the origins of Christmas are founded directly inside of scripture. Not that the holiday itself is founded in scripture, but rather that the reason for the holiday is founded in Scripture, that being the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ of Mary, who was a virgin, and that he was brought forth God in the flesh, so 100% God, 100% man, in the flesh, conceived through the Holy Spirit, brought forth by being birthed by Mary, and he came to save our world of our sins. So incredible sort of celebration that we have about that incredible holiday that really doesn't have a whole lot of rivals in terms of the greatness of the holiday itself. How many people do you know that don't like Christmas? And I mean like, my goodness, when I think about Christmas, I know Muslims who like Christmas. I know Jewish people like Christmas. I know atheists that like Christmas. People that typically don't like Christmas are just really... People that are so rooted in their Christian faith that they find fault inside of Christmas. They find that it's not perfect, and so they find they feel that it's their responsibility to point it out to everybody else that Christmas isn't so great. In fact, the, Kirk Cameron made a movie about it, I think back in 2014. It may have been 2014, maybe 2012. I don't remember exactly. And the name of the movie was called Saving Christmas. Highly recommend that movie. In fact, some of the material I'm bringing forth tonight uh, is in part from that movie. It's also my own ideas as well because I kind of felt the same way that lots of naysayers during Christmas. So to me, it's like, you know, it's a holiday. You're not getting rid of it anytime soon. And the people who mostly want to get rid of the holiday don't have good intentions. They're mostly people that want to get rid of God in general. And one of the best ways to do that is get rid of holidays fun sort of celebrations like Christmas that glorify God and give God all the honor and God all the glory. So we don't want to get rid of Christmas. Christmas does not have pagan origins. So don't feel bad if you're celebrating Christmas. Don't have this conflict in your mind of, oh my goodness, I think that maybe the people who are sacrificing children on the altar were doing the very same things that I'm doing right now. I've heard some people make the argument about Uh, Christmas trees make that argument about Santa Claus and we're going to talk about those things a little bit tonight. Um, I will say that perhaps Christmas has 
replaced a pagan holiday, but I don't think that people have given um, Constantine as much credit as what they sh should. One of the big arguments against having Christmas, especially this time of the year, is that people say that, well, Jesus was not born on December 25th. And no, that's not a bad argument to make necessarily. To tell the truth, I don't think that anybody really knows for a fact. You can even kind of maybe generally figure out when Jesus was born, sort of. But we really don't know for a fact when Jesus was born. And because of that, December 25th isn't, you know, it's, any other day would have been fine too. But December 25th, why not? Um, and the credit that I say that people do not give to Constantine on this, and don't don't get me wrong, I'm not a Constantine fan per se, even though, I, again, I think that people don't give him near as much credit as what he deserves. Uh, and in this respect, Constantine actually gathered together a group of scholars to calculate out when the birth of Jesus would have been. And they took different factors, and the date they happened to come up with was December 25th. Now, was that by hook or crook? Uh, hook or crook? I don't know. It could have been they decided it was going to be 20, December 25th and they just had to find out a justification for it this whole time because maybe they wanted to replace the pagan holiday that took place around that time. Uh, and so they said, well, let's make it December 25th. Okay, let's find out a way to figure that out. I don't know about that. To me, it sounded like a fairly scholarly exercise for them calculating out that December 25th was the birth uh, was the birthday of Jesus Christ. Now, was it? Wasn't it? Honestly, I don't care. If you don't know what Jesus' birthday was precisely, then there's no reason to argue about it because it's as good a time of the year as any, particularly as it relates to the reality that this is the darkest time of the year. And what I like about the Gospel of John is it says the light shines in the darkness. And it gives us this imagery that Jesus is a light that shines through the darkness, that he is the true light that gives light to all of mankind, that we might be able to see the way of salvation. And so December 25th, we'll take it. And I think it's a great time of the year to do it. It's the end of the year. It's a great way to wrap up the year and to move us into the new year even. So some of the symbolism inside of Christmas. <clears throat> the Christmas tree. I've heard people make the argument that it is a pagan symbol. And is it? Wasn't it? Probably was. I don't know. But the Christmas tree is a great symbol for Christmas in the respect that we always use a pine tree, an evergreen tree, to, to, to put up in our homes around Christmas time. We decorate it with all sorts of ornaments. And correct me if I'm wrong, I, I typically don't put up a whole lot of pagan symbols myself on my Christmas tree, so I'm not very worried about accidentally worshiping a different god because I'm not accidentally worshiping a different god. I'm worshiping the Lord our God, the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not too worried about accidentally worshiping a different God, especially since the symbolism that is represented on our tree is just that. It is put there to glorify and honor God. And you can put other fun things on your tree as well to glorify and honor God and just to have a good time. And whoever said there's anything wrong with putting a snowman on your tree for crying out loud, I think that's a wonderful thing. It's 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 good to have fun and to give glory to God in the process. You know, we, we as Christians need to be more willing to have fun and to be creative with the minds that God gave us and the abilities that God gave us to do things to draw attention to God and his kingdom. So I think that the representation of an evergreen evergreen tree is wonderful because an evergreen tree is green all year round. And this is representative of eternal life. So the eternal life that we have in Jesus Christ is how we really should see the evergreen tree. In fact, I remember when I was in school, believe it or not, is when I first learned about that symbolism that an evergreen tree is representative of eternal life. So clearly I had some Christian teachers as I was growing up, particularly in my younger years. I can't remember what grade it was exactly, but I remember I, I did have some teachers that one or two of them even I ended up going to church with later on uh, down the road. And definitely some teachers that were familiar with the Christian symbolism and that themselves were Christians, in fact. So Christmas trees are a great way to celebrate this time of the year. Gifts. So one of the things that has 
really bothered me lately is how people have said, ah, the commercialization of crisp is just buying meaningless stuff and giving it away. Why do we need this stuff? You could give it to this charity or that charity or whatever charity. Reminds me a little bit about that story of when Mary, not Mary Magdalene and not Mary, the mother of Jesus, but the other Mary, uh, Martha's sister Mary, came in to Jesus and she broke this uh, jar of nard, um, that alabaster box, you remember that story? And she poured it over Jesus and she wiped his feet with her hair and, and washed them with her tears as well. And afterwards, you remember what the disciples said? Ah, and Judas particularly, who it says was stealing money from, uh, from the money bag, said, you could have sold this perfume for a lot of money, for like a year's wage, and we could have given it away to the poor. It sounds a lot like that argument right there, saying that why are we buying all this stuff and giving it away to who? Our loved ones. What's wrong with giving good stuff to your loved ones? And I'm not trying to say that we should put that stuff in front of Jesus, but this is a way that we can be generous. Not only that, there is absolute representation inside of it. This is a symbolic act as well, in two ways that I can think of. The first one, being that, first and foremost, being that Jesus himself is the gift given to us by God the Father from heaven, an eternal gift to give us life that we cannot possibly repay God for him giving it to us. And so, when we give gifts to one another, we remember the generosity that God had for us, that he gave his one and only son to die on a cross for our sins and that the least we can do is be generous, to be kind to one another. Also, the second point of symbolism, you remember when the Magi came to Jesus. And yes, I know this was probably significantly after he was born, probably within two years after he was born, that the Magi came to him and presented uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to Jesus Christ. And so we see the gift giving uh, to Jesus Christ, and this is all surrounding the baby Jesus, the young Jesus, the toddler Jesus, whatever, however you want to put it, it is scripturally in that respect represented in Christmas, that we give gifts to one another to honor one another, to show appreciation for one another, and to honor those first gifts that were even given or sometime around the time of Jesus' birth. Again, whether that's the first year, first two years, whatever it may have been, these magi presented gifts to Jesus. Some of the other symbols, and I don't know if these are represented any other way in any, any other tradition, pagan or non, but the Christmas lights. My, I, I love seeing Christmas lights. I love driving around and seeing all the decorations on people's houses. And once again, when I see those lights, I think of light out of darkness. It gets dark so early this time of the year. And seeing the beautiful Christmas lights is so refreshing. It is so nice to see. They're beautiful. And seeing the decorations, seeing uh, the different types of creative ways that people dress up their homes to be able to recognize this time of the year. And yes, of course, Santa Claus. Santa Claus. And mind you, for my family and I, we actually... We, we kind of blew it. We taught our children early on that there is nobody traveling around the world dropping off gifts to all the good boys and girls. Uh, but we did teach them about St. Nicholas. And I don't, I, however you want to teach your children is fine. However you want to go about that, that's cool. I'm not condemning one way and promoting another. That's just how we chose to do it. We chose to teach them about the real man, St. Nicholas. And so they could understand that this whole tradition of Santa Claus is actually based around a well-known church figure. He's less known now than what he was back then, but back then he was very popular. In fact, St. Nicholas was at the Council of Nicaea, which, if I'm not mistaken, was a council that had gathered to determine whether or not Jesus was fully divine. And, of course, within that they found that he they they, they um, agreed that he is fully divine. And amongst those who argued in defense of his full divinity was St. Nicholas. So he is at the Council of Nicaea. There's also a very lovely story about this family. Uh, uh, I believe it was a man and his three daughters, I think it was. And they didn't have a dowry to give to their future husbands. 
And so St. Nicholas, again, I hope I'm not botching this story up too badly, he actually provided them with gifts, a dowry, so that they could get married one day. And again, I don't know exactly how all that tradition goes together as far as having a dowry and all that, but I know that lots of times that women were expected to have something to be able to give to their husband uh, in return for their hand in marriage. And so uh, St. Nicholas uh, helped, again, this is kind of a legendary account. So was it true, wasn't true? It's a very popular account that he gave gold to these young ladies to be able to have for their wedding days. And so St. Nicholas was indeed a real man. And indeed he is alive for all eternity too now as he was a believer in Jesus Christ. And as we know that we are given eternal life. So I think it's important at least for your children to know that. Again, we, had, we didn't teach our children that Santa Claus is flying around in a magical sleigh with reindeer and dropping off gifts, but we did tell them about that, and we said that that is a tradition that some people hold, that they believe that that does happen every year. And so they understand that, and I think that's kind of neat. And I think it's kind of neat to know who the real person is, and we should not lose who St. Nicholas was in all of the lore and all the fanfare and make him out to be some sort of magical elf that flies around the world. That's kind of silly to say he was a magical elf. To say he flies around the world, you know, do whatever you want to. That's that's cool. And I understand the the uh, generos the generosity aspect uh, behind that as well. So, again, not bad-mouthing that at all. In fact, I encourage you teach your children about Santa Claus and you teach them about St. Nicholas. The music. The music around Christmas time is something particularly different. That it's not the same tone. And in fact, I was talking to my wife earlier about a song that isn't necessarily my favorite Christmas song. What was it? It was that Mariah Carey Christmas song, All I Want for Christmas is You. And I know that's a, it's a cheesy one. It's a hokey one. On the same token, it is very well written in terms of the Christmas spirit. Christmas songs have a very unique feel and a very unique spirit to them and they're full of joy and this song is full of joy my, by the way that's not my favorite christmas song by any stretch of the imagination i'm personally a hark the herald angel sings guy myself all these songs to celebrate our lord and savior first of all the actual carols the hymns that have been passed down from generation to generation and then we have all this newer music that has been written within the past century or so uh, to be able to celebrate this time of the year and that we are gathering together because it is colder outside and we are just having a great time celebrating Christmas with everybody. Um, church. Even though this might sound like a negative thing, there are lots of people who only go to church on Christmas, Easter, and other holidays. I've heard some people refer to them as CEO Christians or just CEO church churchgoers. And even though we like people to commit to church, to go to church every week, that at least it's an opportunity to see new people walk through those doors. And sometimes people will say, you know what, I need to be here more often, and they stick around. So it's a great time to be able to reach out to people and to share the love of Christ with them. So all in all, that it's a time to decorate. It's a time to celebrate. And even though some people are sad, we are here to spread the joy on Christmas Day. And most importantly, it's a time to celebrate the Incarnation, this wonderful theological doctrine that God became flesh. He came down to the world to live amongst people. He showed us the way. He showed us the truth. He died on the cross, and he has made the way of salvation possible for us all ultimately reconciling us to God the Father through his sacrifice. And it all started with his birth into our world. So wonderful time of the year, wonderful holiday. Everybody, this is the Bill Sang Podcast. My name is Bill Sang. Please look us up on Rumble, Buzzsprout, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you can find podcasts. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And Merry Christmas.